بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين يغضون أصواتهم عند رسول الله أولئك الذين امتحن الله قلوبهم للتقوى أولئك الذين امتحن الله قلوبهم للتقوى لهم مغفرة وأجر عظيم صدق الله العظيم To respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's nice to come here, nice to see you guys Nice to be here Can I first ask who's not at university or college right now? Put your hands up Who's not in education at all right now? Keep your hands up. Not in any form of education at all. Okay. So we've got most of your students, yes? Am I right in saying that? Okay. And the topic is about finding success in exams. And uh, who's got exams coming up? Put your hands up, please. Ooh, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. You know, the best thing about being at my age is that, alhamdulillah, exams is behind you, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, I tell, you, I tell you, you know they've done all these studies on people and there's people who when they hear the word exam, their legs start shaking. It's, it's a human thing because you know what goes with it? It's not everyone that does, has this. Some people have this, they have butterflies in their stomachs. Because you think about it, You've got to go into the exam hall, you've got to give the test, you've got to sit there. But it's not about those two hours or those five days or two weeks of exams. Most people, it's not about that. Most people, why they've got butterflies in their stomach is for another reason. Let me give you, let me give you a, an example, yeah? The day I actually said I passed my driving test, the day I said that, people said, ah, oh, mashallah, Mubarak ji, Mubarak. You know, people, people now think they all like Mubarak, Mubarak, you know, anything Mubarak, right? So anyway, so uh, they said, Mubarak, you know, you pass first time your driving exam. I said, no, this is my third time I passed. I said, what? Third time? But you just told us like the first time that you've had a driving test, a driving exam, right? So I said, yeah. I've had it twice before and I failed. I said, but how come we never knew? I said, that's the point, isn't it? You gotta be, I didn't say, you gotta, you gotta be, you, know, you gotta go ahead of those people who are gonna put butterflies in your stomach. The more people know about your test, the more unnecessary pressure you're building on yourself. True or not? True or not? Go and tell me. If you went for an exam and you knew that the whole exam from A to Z, and especially when you walk outside that exam hall and you go and collect your certificate from whatever it is, that day when you see a dimbo, an egg, and your failure, you fail that exam. And nobody apart from you and Allah knows that you took that test. Yeah? As in, doesn't matter who else knew about it, but only you and Allah, you know, just are concerned about this at this moment. It's nobody else. Do you, do you really, I mean, are you really going to have inside yourself any worry about the fact that you failed? Yes or no? Tell me, be honest with me. Yes or no? Not really. I'll just retake it again. It's as simple as that. Isn't that right? I just sit and I'll retake it again. When I took my driving test, I didn't tell anyone. I went myself. I sat myself. I failed myself. And I came back to myself, kicking my own self. That was it. No one knew. My brothers never knew. My parents never knew. My friends never knew. Then I booked another test. I went myself. I sat myself, failed myself, kicked myself, came back again, nothing happened. Alhamdulillah. I was back to normal within, within a couple of hours. You know, some guys when they fail, it's like, Ya Allah, it's like, oh my God, my, my brav man, brav, you don't know, you know. 
you know, I don't know how I feel, man. And then, and then you, exp and you know, you tell one guy, and another guy finds out, another guy finds out, another guy finds out. They're all gonna come to you one by one. You're like, I heard about your test. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, what can I say, man? Then you're gonna start making silly excuses. It wasn't really my fault, you know. It was the examiner. He was having a bad day. He's racist. See, I'm brown. He's white. Don't like me, you know. The moment I got in there, he just looked at me and he thought, you're failing. <laughs> and I just carried on and I knew I was going to fail. It's not my fault. The guy was ready. You know, you make silly excuses. I was at the traffic lights. I didn't mean to like, you know, go, go through that. But, you know, I was at the junction after that. And then the right turn came and he thought he put a cross there. For, and I, oh, this, that, no one else was there. You can make any silly excuse you want. But the only reason why you're doing that most of, either is because you really were bad at it. You, know, you, you mucked up, right? And if you weren't really bad at it, then you're making silly excuses because all those people are going to judge you. And that is the reason why most people have got, you know, their, their nerves get racked. Butterflies in their stomachs, their legs start, their feet start shaking. It's because of people. My first advice to you is, as less people as you can, please just involve whoever you have to and no more than that. And one problem with our cultural people is, they, oh my God, they like to talk. And especially, you know, the churches in Pakistan, they all have to know that the exam's coming up. It's like there's no end to it. So you're getting all these churches telling you, Haan ji, beta, tue, medicine ke liye ja raha ji. Oh, Allah ka miyab kere ja. You're thinking, chachi, if you knew that I'm going to fail, you wouldn't be talking like that, chachi, you know? And some of them, Cheers. <laughs> Hope that's the only thing they're drinking this, right? So what happens is, um, you know, sometimes they make it even more difficult for you so bad because they, they just add pressure on because there's all these uncles, aunts, brothers, everybody knows and you're going for the test and it's pressure on pressure on pressure. That's my first advice to you. Don't tell everyone that you're going, just keep it low key as best as you can. I know it's a uni exam, so they're all going to be on your case anyway, but just try and keep it low key. The other thing is, when you're going for the test, you've got to realize that, I mean, before I carry on, you know, you, some of you might have seen on YouTube, I've got this, um, I've got this whole lecture on there about exams, right? how to pass your exam successfully or something. Yeah? So try and see that on YouTube because a lot of the stuff I'm saying there um, is very useful. I'm not going to try and repeat all that stuff here. Otherwise, it's going to be deja vu. You're going to think, oh, yeah. saw him on the screen, now see him in real yeah. He just said the same thing. Mubarak ji, Mubarak ji. So I'm going to give you similar stuff, but in a different way. So I, I will ask you to go and see that. So number one is don't build, build pressure on yourself. The most important thing is that you know, when you're, a, what, what, does a, what does a plumber do, tell me? What does a plumber do? If you can't answer this question, you need to all leave the university right now. What does a plumber do? Oh, you give me technical answers. He lays some tiles. Yeah. He does plumbing. A plumber does what? Plumbing. An engineer does what? Engineering. Whoa, yeah. What does a bricklayer do? You're trying to think I'm going to catch you out now, yeah? He lays bricks, right? What does a student do? What does a student do? Studies. Studies, yeah? That's it. You got it. How many students do you actually know that study? Come on, let's be serious. How many students do you know that actually study and take study seriously? Because student is supposed to study. Now, if study becomes a burden to you, picking a book becomes weight lifting for you, opening the book becomes like, you know, hurt, hurtful to your eyes, yeah? Reading the book hurts your brain. You might as well pack up, my friend, and go home. 
Because a student is supposed to study. And the more you study, the better you get at it. Yes or no? Now when you study, there are techniques of studying. You know, one of our teachers said to us once, he said, um, he said, you know, we used to do grammar. Nahu, so that's grammar. And he said a wonderful thing. He said, I've met students that have studied 20 books of Arabic grammar. 20 books of Arabic grammar. And when I've tested them on that, they don't know grammar properly. But he goes, I will teach you one book of grammar. And the way I'll teach it to you, it will make you independent from the, from the other 19 books of grammar. Did you understand that? So one person comes, he's read 20 books of grammar, Arabic grammar. Another person, the teacher is telling us, he goes, I will teach you one. And you will not have to read the other 19. And that's exactly what he did with, he, he did with us. He taught us one book. But the way he taught it to us, it was on the next level. Now let me te tell you how he taught it. You know when you guys as students come to the lecture theatre, yeah? You know when you come as students to the lecture theatre, yeah? You study Jack. I don't know, do you use that term here? You don't use it. What do you say? You study, how do you say you study nothing? You say Jack as well. Do you say anything else? Some, so I want a glass of Ouija and... Uh, you got, have you got one? No? You study Jack. I'm telling you, you think, oh, what's he talking about? He's insulting us, right? It, no, no, no. I've been to university. You come in, you are the one who has been served. The teacher, the lecturer walks in and he's the one who has studied the subject. So he comes in front of you and he presents, he summarizes the whole chapter to you. He's read books and books of it. He summarizes the best he can in lecture notes through PowerPoint presentations, through probably some kind of workshop. He tries to demonstrate, he tries to put that in a nutshell in front of you. And what you do is you come, wake up just about, you know, on time in the morning, get to the lecture theatre slightly late. You know, it's okay, man. I'm in university, you know. You sit down there, you listen to the gist of what I said, if you can focus, if your phone doesn't get in the way. You know, half of them down there underneath the table. They're not taking notes, uh, sir, just you know, a bit of notes, you know, <laughs> good student, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> just taking it on Facebook, what can I say, you know? So they're not really taking notes, all they're doing is texting or whatever to each other, whatever they're doing, they're busy on the phone. Some of them, not all of them, please don't get me wrong. When the lecturer has finished and he gives them the notes, it's free notes, free. Mufat, you know Mufat, you know Mufat, free of charge. Our people love free of charge. When you give free of charge, it means you abuse it. If they had to pay for it, if they had to pay for it, seriously, they would go and read it. If you paid for something, you'd be tempted. you say, you know what, I paid. At least you will look after that piece. Yes? Most of those lecture notes end up in some folder, in some bag that goes through the rain that gets wet and drenched somewhere or in some loft or some cupboard or somewhere where you don't even know where it exists. Anyone, you know, I'm talking about over time. Yeah? Yes, you take it out for your exam time. What good is it if you take that much of notes outside for your exam time? What good is it? You can't cram all that information in. You can't. If you took it piece by piece, when the lecturer gave you his notes, you took it piece by piece, you actually studied. You know, they always give you extra readings. Yes or no? Yes or no? Go tell me. Yes. Now, put your hands up. Honestly, who does the extra reading? Put your hands up. Who does the extra reading? We've got one student, mashallah. <laughs> mashallah. Extra reading, hardly anyone does. All those sources where he got it from, anyone hardly does. And then to try and keep that summarized information within your own notes and try and bring it in your head, no one really focuses on that level. Why? Because we have become the teacher and the teacher has become the student. We dictate to the, to the teacher how we want them to teach us. That's us becoming the teacher and then becoming some kind of student. 
What I mean by all of this is, my friends, is that, you know, we're living in times where we're really, really some ways, you know, we, we've, we're spoiling the, the whole process of learning. The process of learning is supposed to be, and this is what our teacher did in that grammar lesson. He told us, when we come to that chapter, we're going to get to this chapter tomorrow. He said, when we come to the lesson, I'm not explaining to anyone about the lesson. I want you guys to explain to me what that is saying. I'm not opening my mouth until you guys tell me what it means. Now, here we are. We're, talking about, we're not talking about English. English is really, is, is very easy compared to Arabic. Anyone who studied Arabic knows that there's so many combinations in Arabic when you read it. It's a Semitic language. And all Semitic languages have, you know, they don't have the same letters spelling the same word. It could be spelt in so many different ways. So what happens is that we are spending two to three hours before we've even known what this chapter is about. We come to the lesson sweating, seriously sweating. Because this teacher is going to rip into us if we can't explain to him what's going on. So he, and, and the other thing he had was he would never have a system. Like if I said in a class, I said, okay, you're going to read day number one. You read day number two, day number three, and that, 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 that. Well, I'll give you 10 days for 10 students. What's going to happen is that the seventh guy is only going to prepare for the seventh day. He's not going to prepare for day one, day two, day three, four, five, six, or eight, nine, ten. Do you agree with me? He's just concerned about day number seven. And that's the system that you would have. But this teacher was on another level. What he told us is, he said, <clears throat> I want everyone to prepare for every single lesson. I could ask in the lesson, student two, you read. Student six, now you read. And he reads a bit. Student seven, you read. Student five, you read. He, <coughs> he can change whenever he wants. So you are always under constant pressure. When you had, when it was your turn, you had to read it, explain it to him. Now, you're thinking, this is harsh, man. You don't even know the subject, and the guy's telling you, you teach me. Whoa, what kind of teaching is that? The guy's taking it easy, right? No, he's not taking it easy. He knows his subject. But what he's doing is, he makes, he turns you to a teacher. When he's turned you to a teacher, the way you will understand that subject, subhanAllah, there won't be many like you walking around. When you've explained to him, what he then does is, you've explained it, people have understood it, students have understood it, he says, close the book now. And then what he would say then? Was that necessary for us to... Uh, we're revealing some uh, student notes, yeah? Was that necessary for you guys? Mashallah, yeah? So, um, the guy wants to talk about health, finance, education. And guess what? Asylum interview. Guys, get out of here, quick. Right, now, um, <clears throat> what used to happen in the lesson is, we do the lesson, he explains everything about the lesson, after we explain to him about the lesson. Now, when he starts explaining, he goes into the deep background of everything we study. That used to be on a day-to-day -day basis, every day we used to sweat coming to the lesson, Every day he used to make us teach to him and then he would teach us. Unless we taught him, showed him that we've understood it. You know what he used to do in the end? He used to say to us, when you've explained the book, he said, close the book. Tell me in your mother's tongue, what did you, what did you understand from that? Tell me in your first language. Tell me how you can understand. Tell me what did that just say? And we had to say it in your broken, whatever, colloquial, whatever you can say, just say it. And if he knows that you understood it, that's it. He'll teach you then. Now, what happens in our universities is it's the opposite way around. They come inside, they give you the whole theory, they just give it to you. That's it, my job's done. I get my salary at the end of the day. I, I showed them, I guided them, that's it. Now, you, if you don't get up and start to become proper students to study that material that he's just given, you've just shot yourself in the foot. And by Allah, most students, then they take those notes in, goes in their bag, it's not going to come out until near exam time. Do you agree or disagree with me? Agree or disagree with me? They might look at it now and again. They might read a few things here. Subhanallah. That's where the whole of the process goes wrong. 
Because what you're supposed to do is, it's better that you cram in little parts of information that's limited than for you to cram in large part, sections of knowledge in a small period of time. So bet, let me summarize that again. It's better for you to put in or cram in little parts of information in a large area of time than for you to cram in large, part, large you know, parts of information in a small part of time. Agree or disagree? Agree or disagree? Good. Because guess what? We're in March right now. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that by May or June, right? So my advice to you, I don't know why these guys didn't like put this subject in September. Uh, but you know what? If we did in September, you guys wouldn't come, would you? <laughs> you think, what? Exams? We just had one in, like, in the summer, right? Not talking about exams right now. See, that's the problem. Because what people don't do is they don't think that it's really important to prepare for exams in September. Yes, you're preparing for exams September, October, November, December, through January, February, all the spring, all the way till May comes, June comes throughout the whole of the process, you're supposed to prepare for exams. That's where you take little bits of information and you put it into a large amount of space. In about nine months, in about 10 months, you're putting that information. Whereas most students, what they do is, now it's coming to April, everyone's getting into their revision routine. From March, April, May, two months, what they're trying to do is they're trying to cram inside information that's supposed to be spread out in the whole of, let's say, nine or 10 months. Now, let me tell you, when I was, um, when I was in university, doing my MA, you know, most of these courses that you're doing, I don't care what course are you doing, you, you know, you're doing, whether it's a bachelor's, master's, whatever, um, you know the most useful book, even for the bachelor's or the master's, the most useful book, is the A-levels book. You know your subject that you're doing. If you're doing science, if you're doing, I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be. It might be even psychology. It might be, I don't know, media. You know the A-level book they have? You know the A-level book they have? Oh, guys, are you in this world? You know they have an A-level normal textbook out there that normal college students start getting and cramming in for their exams, yeah? Yes? Hello? Yep. Are you thinking, what's he talking to us about A-level? University, yara, get it? Yes, I get it, but I'm giving you something to remember. That college book is more worthy that you put that information for your subject inside your head than for you to try and deal with your MA, BA, massive volumes of books in your subject. You're going to think, I'm nuts. I'm not nuts. You know, if you can get, remember my, my teacher said, he said, I can te I'll teach you one book that will make you independent from 19 other books. You know that A-level book, if you just take it literally, just learn the terminologies, learn the um, actual you know, definitions, learn the phrases, learn the key words, learn the references, learn the people who have made those references. That book is a lot to take it. It's one thick book. It might be A-level biology. It might be A-level chemistry. That one book has got everything you need summarized in it. And if you can get that information in here, and you're able to present it in a BA degree exam for, for bachelor's or for master's, I'm telling you, you're going to pass with an A. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think, what? I'm going to fail this because A-level book is meant to be for A-level students in college. But you know what? That's got all the information you need. Even if you could just summarize that much in your, and just take that in your head, that would be a lot. Because most people, when they study at degree level, it's the same information they're doing over again in just a little bit more depth. That's all they're doing. Do you agree or disagree with me? Do you think I'm, I'm crazy, right? I actually... When I was doing my psychology um, degree, I actually found that very useful. Because, I mean, yes, you do need some more depth of level. I'm not saying you don't need anything deeper than that. 
but the ground and the basis of what you need. If you haven't got that information in, there's no point of you trying to create inside here a motorway. There's no, there's no point of creating that when you haven't even got the space, space for a road. You know what I'm saying? You need to create that over time. And when you look at your books, you need to understand a human being can only take certain amount of information and is going in and registering. There's a certain amount of time for it. When it hits a certain moment of time, you're not taking any more information in. You're reading, you're looking, you're whizzing through, you're trying to get it in, but you know the brain is saying, it's sleeping, my friend. You know that time is? That time is 45 minutes. How long did I say? What's your typical lecture time? How long is your lecture time? 50 minutes. If they put it at 50 minutes, they probably got it right. 45 and 50 minutes. Do you have an hour? Anyone here has an hour lecture? Anything, yeah? I can guarantee you 45 minutes and by that time you're switched off. Anyone who's done any studies themselves? And this is from mass studies. If you study yourself a book and you look at it for 45 minutes, you know, your brain doesn't register as well. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to give your brain a rest. Give it a break. Come back to it. You'll be fresh again. The only way some people have tried to, you know, do hours of studies and still take it. I mean, some people are naturally gifted, alhamdulillah. We're talking about the average person here. Um, the way some people have been able to take in mass um, information in, like I'll give you one example, is of Imam Muhammad, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. He used to study throughout the whole of the night without break. And he had two tricks to it. The whole night he used to study without taking a break. From Isha till Fajr, you know, except for Tahajjud and so on, yeah? Whole night. He had two tricks to it. Number one is, and you're going you're gonna, to, when I say this, you're going to be looking at me going, oh, man, that's raw, man. How do you say raw in Glaswegian thing? It's something raw, like, you know, it's raw. What do you say? Sorry? What is it? You guys are so quiet, mashallah. MashaAllah, you know, SubhanAllah. Are you guys all training to become librarians? <laughs> What's wrong with you guys, man? Speak, for God's sake, yeah? So, you know, sorry? Hardcore. Hardcore. That's it, man. Guys, come up with it, right? You're going to think this is hardcore. And what happens is, <laughs> what happens is, Imam Muhammad sitting there, Imam Muhammad sitting there, and he has a little bowl next to him. And in that bowl, he's got some water. But in that water, he's put some chilies inside. Real chilies. He's taken chili out, taken seeds out, and he's dipped it into the water. And when he starts to get tired, he dips his two fingers in that water and he goes like that. Hardcore! <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Burning his eyes to keep himself awake. And the second trick he had was, he used to open six books at one time. Six books at one time. And when he used to look at one, after a little while he used to look at another one. He used to read that one. Then he used to look at another one, and he used to look at another one, and then another one. After a little, every now and again he used to change between the six books. And someone said to him, why are you doing that for? What are you doing all of this for? He said, look, if imams like us are sleeping throughout the night, then where's the ummah going to go? If imams like us are sleeping the night, then what's going to happen to the ummah? So that's why I need to keep myself awake and study this. So he's put chilies in his eyes and so on. And the second thing is, the reason why I switch between books is, he says, after a little while, your brain sort of gets a bit numbed with the thing that you're reading. Does it happen or does it not happen? You know, after you're reading pages of the same thing, you kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, important information is being thrown at you, but you kind of feel, yeah, you kind of feel that that information is not seriously going inside. And, and what he does, he says, when I get to the stage where, you know, I'm getting a bit sort of normal to this book, he says, I switch. Because when you switch to a different book, it becomes fresh information. So you're engaged in it properly again. And when he feels that he's getting a bit numb with that, he switches to another book. And like that, he kept himself awake throughout the night. Allahu Akbar. 
Now, what I want to say to you guys is, I don't know how many subjects you're studying, what you're doing. You can take benefit from this. But most of all is students. What do students do again? Study, yeah? Allahu Akbar. Some students, studying to them is the last thing they do. And they'll get everything else, every other distraction that comes, becomes the thing that they must go for. If as a student you can't say no, if as a student you can't tell your friends, listen, I really like you, buddy, but you better stay out of my way. You know what I'm saying? Like, because if you like me too, then you should be studying and I should be studying as well. Or if, the, if it's not a student you're talking to, just tell him straight up that, look, guy, you know, I know you passed that age of studying, yeah? But please have mercy on me and get out of my face. You know, I don't want to see you. Because the thing is, if you can't say no, you know, like the other day somebody said to me, Subhanallah, the, like if you think about it, you know, in, in our days, well, you know, when I say in our days, I make myself look really old, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> right? Back in the days, you had to actually pick a dictionary up and look up a word. I don't think people use dictionaries anymore. They just go to the phone, hey, what's that word? Yeah, yeah, go to Google, yeah, 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 that's that word, yeah, yeah done. Right. I mean, okay, fine, it's convenience. But you know when you look up a dictionary or a physical book and you have to go through it and you find it yourself and you search for it, that pattern of searching for it, and when you see it, somehow even a word from that is more likely to stay in your mind than from something like this. Because this is virtual. And we, you know, you've seen the whole world on this, in light. You've seen information on this on light. You've seen photos on this, messages on this. You've sent loads of emails on this in light, but you haven't actually seen the physical thing. Tell me true or not here. Yeah? Just picture it in your head right now. Some email that you got. Physical email. Just I want you to picture one email you got. Physical handout email to you. Can you almost see the shape of the font that you actually read that document in? Yes or no? Put your hands up. You know the style of the font? More or less, I'm not saying exact font. I'm saying, you know, like either the H was written like that or the H was written like, you know, the Roman, you know, Times New Roman style, whatever it was, yeah? Can you remember more or less the font that you read it in? Put your hands up. Or you, how many of you have received an email by, by actually given to you by paper? Put your hands up first. Jesus, man. Allahu Akbar. There are six of you. Allahu Akbar. The rest of you have never each actually seen an email. Oh, Allah. Have you ever received a letter that's actually been written for you? Put your hands up. Allahu Akbar. I hope it's not a love letter. You know, like, you know. It could be one, you know, like from your wife. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. But, you know, not, not the other one. Anyway. So when you receive the letter, now tell me the honest, honest thing here. Yeah? Do, you, do you feel that is different from reading it on the screen? Yes or no? Do you all agree to that? What makes it different? Because you know there's something about the actual paper and the pen itself that until the day of judgment is never going to die out. The pen is never going to go out. No matter how much technology comes out, the pen will never disappear. Because Allah has taken an oath on the pen. In Surah Qalam, 68th Surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, Noon wal qalam wa I swear by the pen and whatever it has written. There is a difference between you, tell me this true or not, yeah? When you've looked at an actual book and you've, you've seen the information and then after that you've closed the book, yeah? Can you or can you not? remember roughly what part of the book you saw it in and whether it was on the right side or the left side, the top or the bottom. Can you or can you not remember that? Put, just say, say yes and put your hands up. Yep. Okay. Can you do the same thing with the screen? Yes or no? You can't because it's just up, down, scroll. You can't do it. The brain works differently. I'm telling you there is more benefit in studying through actual paper through actual books and looking into that and trying to take the information from there than to take it from a screen. I'm telling you from studies, humans 
still in this day and age of the age of technology are more accustomed and they will take the information better from pen and paper or from something actually written or physically printed out than something which is still on the screen now i'm not i'm not dissing this i'm just all i'm saying is that it's very good for you to find information quickly that's fine it's very good for you to try and find something in an organized format if you want to, that's fine but the thing is you for you to take the information from here and to keep it there is a serious serious difference between taking from here and taking from a book today it's all about you know all this powerpoint presentation this and that you know how it used to be in the in the days before you know if you actually go into the 60s the same universities that you've got in this country in the 60s they used to be quite strict with the exams, but you know the learning, the learning itself was a lot higher. Because one of the things they, they didn't do in the 50s, 60s and so on is, they didn't dumb down, they didn't water down the information. They kept it where it was. So you had to push yourself up to get to the level of the language of those books. They didn't water it down for you. Today, everything's watered down. You know when everything's watered down and summarized and you come in a nice warm lecture, theatre, sit down, look at the lecturer who's been awake all night and giving you the information and you look at him and, oh, okay, I'm with it, geezer. You know, I finish it. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can go now, yeah? And you take the notes and put it in your bag and you walk off, right? Subhanallah, that wasn't the case before. People had to actually go to the library. Allahu Akbar, there is a word called the library. <laughs> you know, libraries now are closing down. I know university libraries are still, you know, they're, they're still going, you know, alhamdulillah. I think that's, the, those are probably the only libraries that are going to remain. It's very sad. We've got a whole culture of public libraries being closed. Yes or no? Yes? It's really sad because if the nations that we're growing amongst don't have the, you know, they don't have that zeal to become readers and it's all about all this information give us, given to us through the media, we are seriously dumbed down. I find it like when I catch up on the news, I don't watch the news. I find it so, so dumb to watch the news. Six o'clock news. The missing airplane in the Malaysian MH370. Officials have said that they found some debris. And then they show you some pictures and they look for it. But unfortunately, the night has come, so they, st they stopped all the investigation. Next news. Granny Smith has had her cat on the, on the little bark tree and she's tried all day to get it down. Fireman came all the way down to, um, you know, whatever little street that you've got might be, you know, I don't know. Was it, what was this area called? Is it Pollock Shore or something? Is it? Pollock Shore, is that, is that right? Yeah. All the way down to Pollock Shore in this time, and they'll show you the, 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 you know, the whole uh, fire engine bringing the ladder up and Granny Smith smiling with a cat in her hand. Who in the world needs to know about her? <laughs> and even when I'm talking about the actual you know, plane or whatever I'm missing, yeah, I can get the information in seconds. If I get the, like, that's a good thing to see, I think, news straight and to read it. To actually read the news straight from the website and get what you want in five to ten minutes, no more than that, and you've got all the news you want. That's more productive than for you to sit there and get the information about some kind of football. And they're going to show you Wenja or some other. Who's your best player down here? You don't have any best players. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> you guys are late on that one, man. You should have said some name. Anyway, whoever's your best player down here, right? They're going to show you his goal or something. Oh, do you really need to know? You're a student, you're a student, and you're going to seriously spend half an hour taking the news through that. You're going to spend another 20 minutes, right? Some people, seriously, man, you students need to know, and I know some of you do this already, but you need to find the shortest cut to eating your food, the shortest cut to living, the shortest cut to try and just get on with life because the studying should be the most important thing. And Allahu Akbar, you know, we've got now guys and girls who come to university and the biggest thing they've got to do for that day 
is they're going to dress themselves up. Allahu Akbar. Seriously. The guy gets up in the morning, he's going to comb his hair, gel it, gel it. And he's going to say to the guy next to him, you know, he was in his hostel, he's going to say, Bruv, I'm fitna. I'm fitna. You know? <laughs> when they look at me today, I'm fitna, bruv. And a girl on the other side, she's spending an hour, hour doing her face up. What in the world is wrong with you? One hour on your face? When you got books to study, guy, you're spending 45 minutes in the shower? When you got books to study, that's a serious problem. And there's guys and girls, what they're doing in these campuses and so on, yeah, is they're seriously wasting time. When they get together, socializing. You got time to socialize and you're a student. Allah Akbar, you know, you, you're seriously doing yourselves big damage here. You socialize now and again. I'm not saying no to it. You have one day in the week, fine. My friend, one day in the week. One day in the week, just take a full break if you want. No one's going to say anything to you. Take a full day break. Either you say from Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, that's your day break. You do anything else but study in that time, no problem. But don't you tell me that six days or the rest of the week, you need to do all your socializing between that. And I would advise you, yeah, look guys, my generation, the generation, like my generation, we did not even have the internet. We never had the internet. We, mobile phones came out in the 90s. I was in the school in the 80s. And the thing was, if you needed to grab hold of someone, you had to phone their home telephone. And that's the only way you got hold of them. And half the time, you didn't want to phone because his dad's going to pick it up. <laughs> and then you're going to have to act like Uncle G that got the wrong number. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Because you don't want to talk to his dad. And that's the only way you got hold of someone. Or you met them somewhere. Or you made an appointment to meet someone. And half the time they weren't there. That you waited around or you went off. Oh, I couldn't see you. This, that. That's it. Then came the days when the, I mean, the generation before me, they didn't even have those telephones. They either met in person or they wrote actual letters to each other. That's it. That was the form of communication. The generation after me, they grew up with the, tele with the mobile phones. First, the mobile phones were just like phone, actual phone. But you know, these things now, they're used very less actually phoning. It's now all, all, all about instant messaging. And the amount of messages that you get from the amount of people that you know and the amount of stuff that's coming to you, seriously say to yourself, how much of this do I need? And if you don't want to get, you know, one of the, one of the things that our, um, one of the things that the elders of this ummah, they had as a power was the focus of study without distractions. They gave up their life for studying without distractions. Distractions is the big thing. If you can get distracted, if you get distracted, whether you get distracted easily or not, but you get distracted, you're, it, it, it's like, it's like you're losing in your own race. You're on a racetrack and you're supposed to not look at the crowd. You know, if you're, if you're, a race, if you're, if you're in a race, you're in a Formula One or you're in some other car, and you, what should be on your head? Should it be the other cars and the racetrack or should it be the, 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 the crowd and the camera flashes? Which one? The first or the second? The first, right? So you're supposed to have, be aware of all the other cars, where they are, and the racetrack. Where's the bends coming? And I need to get to the finish line before everyone else, or get there in time. All the flash, flash and photography and people you know, saying how good you are, you better ignore all of that. Because if you can't ignore it, you're losing the race. Yes? Imagine some guys like F1 is like, yeah, hi, hi, yeah. Man, you're going to be in, you know, you're going to be on the other side. You're going to be the Akhira very soon. You're going to be Shaheed. You know what I'm saying? Like, you start looking that way. You're studying, yeah? And you want this thing, phone, internet, messaging, friends, hanging around, social time, to try and distract. You're losing it big time. So you should be one of the most organized people. Now, in terms of organization, what you need is, I'll tell you one, one good thing that you could do is that, you know, the kind of friends that you have, 
you better be careful in the friends that you choose. Because the friends that you choose, those friends are either going to make it for you or they're going to break you. If you have a friend who knows the limits of disturbing you and interacting you nicely, he knows the, the fine line between the two, that's a good friend. If the friend doesn't know the limit, that's not a good friend. If that friend of yours talks too much, yeah, put a donut in his mouth. Put a gob stop sucker, you know, stopper in his mouth. Seriously, that shouldn't be your friend. If someone talks too much, be straight with them. Say, bruv, you know, do some dhikr. Earn some jannah. You know, start talking to the angels next to your shoulder. Subhanallah, subhanallah, write it down. Subhanallah, subhanallah. You want to talk, talk some sense. Some guys, they just talk rubbish. All day, they just can talk. Some of them talk about what happened in university, politics, what happened in the world, this and that. Oh, do you see the goal? Do you see football? Do you see this, this and that? Cha, 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 cha. What is going on? You want to study? You're a student? Or are you, are you here to socialize? Choose your friends. If you have a quiet friend, is better than, and when you're a student, a quiet friend is better than to have a chatty friend. And between the two, whichever one has got wisdom to know that studying comes first over socializing, that's the best friend you can get. And you should stay in their companionship. You should make them your friend. You should make them your role model. And the best, best friend you can find is the one that's organized with time. Biggest problem most people have and I'm giving you information which you would go out there and get for 200 pound for a course a go. Seriously, people are paying hundreds of bucks. What do you call bucks in the thing? Yeah? What do you call it? Quid. Quid. Yeah. <laughs> hundreds of quid. Yeah? Or bucks, or so you call pounds, yeah? Or G's, yeah? They're, they're spending all that money out there to get this information. You know the biggest information is? You look in. You look in entrepreneurship, you look in the most successful men and women in the world today, you look in the most successful people across the globe in many different areas. One key thing these successful people have, whether it's religious, non-religious, whether it's people in academia, non-academia, one key thing all or most successful people have is that they are organized with their time. And guess what? Most people are disorganized with their time. Do you agree or disagree with me? Like I'm talking, when I say time, you better be proper organized. You get up for Fajr, your day starts. Don't go to sleep. You get up for Fajr, some people are looking at, what, Fajr? What, what's Fajr, man? I never studied that, man. What's happening? Fajr is more important than university time. Some guys, they will make sure that the alarm goes off and they take it seriously. You know, the alarm can go off as many times as you want. But it depends on you whether you take it seriously or whether you don't. You understand? So if you don't want to take it seriously, like, uh, 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 right? If you want to take it seriously, uh, yalla, yalla, get up, get up, get up, because it's university time. My friend, Fajr comes before university time. Allah comes before your studies. Remember that. So in the morning, you get up and you get up for Fajr and make it your habit not to sleep straight out of Fajr. If you're going to sleep for a little while and get a quick rest and get back up, it's good. You know, you know with sleeping, there's a pattern. If you sleep and you make it a long sleep, you need to, there's a, there's a part that comes. You make, you know, like for example, if you need seven hours, you got your seven hours and you get awake and you still doze off and you still sleep. If you get to the 9 hours or 10 hours, your body will need to sleep the 11th and 12th hour to put it back to normal again. It goes into reverse mode. If you eat the same thing, if you eat and you're full and you stop, as in full as in, you, you know, you think, yeah, should I eat a bit more, should I not eat a bit more? You're full, my friend. When your body says, should I take a bit more, should I not take a bit more? You're full. The mistake you make is, you say, yeah, let me have a bit more. Then you have too much. Then you have too much water. Then you know what happens. You know what happens. Too much food in there, too much water in there, make, you know, increases the body heat. 
And when it increases the body heat, and your body's nice and warm and relaxed, yeah, and you're trying to study here, yeah, yeah, you're going to be studying in Jannah, brother. <laughs> you're going to be sleeping with some hurain in your head. You're not going to get to studying that book because you've got too much body heat coming up because you ate too much and because you went over the limit. The best is that you balance your eating and you balance your sleep as well. When you've just woken up, just get up. When you need sleep again, have, it's better for you to have small, sharp naps than for you to have long periods of sleep. It's better for you to have small bits of food that keep you going than to have large amounts that just make you go to sleep. And you know the um, study um, room that you've got? You've got to regulate the temperature of that against your body temperature to keep it not too warm, not too relaxed, and not too cold. It's just going to be just in between. Because that's where your alertness is going to be. If you make it too hot or too warm, you're going to be asleep. If you make it too cold, you're not going to enjoy sitting there and learning. So you've just got to get, get it right. So sleep and food, you need to keep it controlled. Apart from other things that you've got to keep controlled. When you've got these obstacles under control, your social life, your friends, your technology, your media world, your social sort of networks, you've got all that under control. You've got your sleep under control, you've got your eating under control, right? And you've got organized time. Now begins study. There's quite a few obstacles you've got to get out of the way. Most people get stuck in these obstacles and they're not able to move on. They're not able to actually study properly. So now when you study, you've got to study 45 minutes, like I said, take a break. The best break is get some proper fresh air. Get some good oxygen in your lungs. Fresh oxygen in your lungs is good for your brain. Move away from your study place. Get up, get the circulation of your body, the blood of your body going. So either you do some real exercise, or you go for a walk, or you go outside, or you just change completely the environment you were in and come back fresh for another 45 minutes and you'll seriously take the information in. You do that over time. Every day, more or less, with your little breaks in between and your one day a week break here, yeah? you do that from September all the way till May, yeah? I'm telling you, you're going to walk in the exam hall like a person who has just conquered a whole castle. You're going to walk in there with all the information you need. And in the other um, video, the one that is about how to pass your exam successfully, now, guys, see that one because the information I've said in this one, most of it now is not in that one, right? So in that one, what I've said is the book that I've told you, you know, I've told you to get, which is um, How to Use Your Head. How to Use Your Head by Tony Buzan or some pronounce it Buyan or something. B-U-Z-A-N. Tony Buzan, How to Use Your Head. Now, that will teach you teaching techniques and so on. And doesn't matter how slow you are in actually preparing for your exams, you will be able to prepare for your exams properly. But after all of this, you know, all the things that you're going to do in terms of preparing for your exam. See, I can see right now, you know, we've gone over the 45 minutes, haven't we? Some of you are like, shake, you're getting boring now. Yeah? After all of that, don't forget, the biggest, or should I say in your language, biggest, biggest, yeah? Thing that you must keep in your mind, above all of this, is your connection with Allah. If your connection with Allah is there, it, it can only enhance your entire learning. Information stays in here based on your taqwa, your awareness of Allah. The more, the more aware you are of Allah, the longer you will keep the information in here. The less you are aware of Allah, the less the information will have will, will stay inside here. When Imam Shafi rahimahullah, he complained to his teacher, Wakir, he said, I can't keep information in. I can't retain it. He told him straight up, he said, stay away from sins. Because this knowledge is a light from Allah. And those who sin don't receive that, that, that light. So you don't keep that knowledge inside here. If you want to keep the information inside here, then you've got to have taqwa. And that taqwa is 
that you keep Allah before all the people in front of you. You guys are young, and you know, young people, they are the best people and the worst people. You're two together, man. You're the best people because all revolutions come through you people. You know, young people, they're not into their old politics. Young people, they, they've got hot blood and they can make things change. But young people, when that hot blood goes down the wrong, <laughs> wrong vein, you know, they could become crackpots. You know, young people can go the wrong way or the right way. If they go the right way, alhamdulillah. If they go the wrong way, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Right? And they'll show you some serious damage. So you guys are the best of people and the worst of people. You decide which one you want to be. And saying that, what I'm going to say is, your energy is of a very good level. Don't waste it in the young beauty Allah has given you. Now all of you lot are handsome and all of you are pretty. Don't try and make it even more. And become a target for one another. Just don't do it. You know, most people in universities, they think that, you know, I've got to, you know, like the next thing my papa, my mama said after my exams is I get a job and then I get a house, then I get a pretty wife. I get the trial, you know, job, house and wife. Man, you seriously lost it. If you think that by you making yourself look extra pretty handsome, that you're going to get that thing you missed out because the person who's going to fall in love with you is already destined to do that based on your normal face. Not the one that you basically put everything else on to, <laughs> to look like some kind of cat walking on a little show. You know? So don't get distracted with all of these things. And guys, you know, guys, the boys, yeah, I'm saying, yeah? You guys, please do me a favor. And I have to say, I want to say openly. Guys, learn how to use the toilet, man. Seriously. Boys, especially. You know, don't go, every time you go to the men's toilet in a university, right? And the sister's toilet, alhamdulillah, Allah makes them sit down. <laughs> the men, seriously, I have to, I'm just going to take my opportunity to say this. If you can't keep yourself clean, then the angels are not going to come to you. If the angels of mercy don't come to you, you're not getting the barakah from Allah with your knowledge. I'm being serious with this. Learn how to use it by sitting down. Don't, you know, just, you know, wash the whole place, you know, before you come out. Just don't do that. Do yourself a favor. Because end of the day, you've got a, you've got a grave that is coming and if you don't use the toilet properly, you've got some serious punishment that is lying ahead. If you use it properly, you get a reward for the entire time you were inside there. Now, they, the, one, the one big reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, I go and lecture in most universities. When you go into the toilet area, you see, subhanAllah, la ilaha what are these guys doing, man? I know you've got non-Muslims here as well, but you know, sometimes you, you come in and you think, yeah, Muslims have just used this, man. So, and be considerate as well. You know, like when you do wudu as well in the sink, yeah? Don't try and make it look like you just had a shower. You know, like the water's everywhere. The non-Muslims, they, they're going to judge us as well. They're going to think, subhanAllah, what kind of deen is this? At five times a day, they turn it into a bath. You know, I walk in there and I feel like tiptoe in there because some Muslim guy is like getting ready to pray to his Allah. <laughs> Seriously. You know, when you, water might spill, have some tissue ready, clean it. Anything wrong with cleaning the place? Clean it nicely. So the next side comes, he sees, says that you know, it's a new, nice, you know, clean Muslim and so on. The reason why I'm saying this is because, look, our deen has come to us to teach us everything about the, about the whole of the deen. It all goes with your study. The way you live your life, the way you have your taqwa, the more taqwa you have, the more you'll be able to keep your information in your mind. Any du'as and so on, du'as to use to try and make your exams better. I've said it all in the other um, video, if you haven't watched it, it's only 55 minutes or something, just watch it please because it's going to take me another 55 minutes to say that stuff here, right? And already some of you are, you know, you know had enough, yeah? So... Mm -hmm.